Your Bible, if you would, you see it up on the screen, 1 Corinthians 15. I feel weird today. Not, not weird funny or weird comical or anything like that. I just, I don't know how to describe it. Um, I don't even know, I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to convey it. Uh, maybe it's a different leading of the spirit or maybe there is a spirit here that should not be here or I don't know so you pray for me this morning uh, I am getting a little tired already but I wouldn't uh, Lisa kept looking at me Friday we was out with family and people that I don't get to see very often my uncle and aunt uh, live down in Little Rock and uh, my aunt Mary Jo lives down in Atlanta and I haven't seen her in several years uh, and she's got one surviving son I haven't seen him since I was probably about 12 and uh, it was just good to be around him and and I, I kept saying I wouldn't miss this for the world I wouldn't it's, I like being around family and we had a I know you're up there I'll turn it on when I'm good and ready how's that um, and then we had a family get-together yesterday, and a man there, I'm kidding you, there was a bunch of us Corzines there. That's my mother's maiden name. And um, so all, practically all of my kids were there, practically all of Melissa's kids were there, and the grandkids, and, and then the relatives from out of town, and we just, we had a good time, really did. And I was tired, but I wouldn't have missed it for the world. You know how it's good to get together with family, amen? You got some families that hate each other, don't want to be around each other. Well, we just, we just don't have family like that, and, and I like it that way. So, and the same today, um, I'm tired, I don't, right now I don't feel all that good, but I wouldn't miss this for nothing. The opportunity to be with God's people in God's house. Uh, even if I had arranged to bring another preacher in today, I still would have been here and uh, still would have been with you people because I love you. And I got lonely this week is what I did. Didn't have nobody around. Oh, poor me, right? But uh, I missed everybody and I'm glad to be here this morning. So you pray for me uh, that I can preach what God would have me to preach this morning. All right. We've uh, started on this series uh, about our minds and what goes on in our minds. And um, last night, uh, in fact, early this morning, I got up about three and uh, kind of went back over my notes again and was looking at it. And I decided to call this one either a messed up mind or a made up mind. And uh, you're going to have one or the other in this world. And as I was saying during Sunday school, uh, I got the opportunity to catch up on some things I wanted to look at. People sent me emails and videos to watch and, and uh, watching just how vile and wicked this nation has become in a very, very short time. It's been building. It's been building up. But... It's, it's really taken off the nastiness, the, um, the absolute utter rebellion, not just to God, but to nature itself. We're rebelling against everything in this world and especially this country. I mention this country because this is my country. This is my home. I'm an American. I love America, I would love, I, I'm, I consider myself a patriot. I'd wrap myself in that flag any day. I, I would fight and die for this land if I had the ability and the opportunity. Uh, but I don't like what we've become in the last few years. I don't like it at all. So I'm glad that I've got something else that I can be part of and something else that I can stand up for and something else that I can be proud of. And that is the Word of God. 
my Savior, Jesus Christ, and the way of the cross. Somebody say amen. And uh, you're in this world that we live in, there is, there, we're, we're getting to a point now where I believe God is going to draw a very clear line. If you go back into look at the book of Exodus, you'll see that God had the Israelites in Goshen. That was a place picked out for them by a previous Pharaoh who when uh, J Joseph brought his family up during that, uh, those last remaining years of the famine, they all settled in Goshen. That land was given to them. That was known as the Jews' land, and they lived there. And while God was pouring out His wrath upon Egypt, those who lived in Goshen were safe from every bit of that. Not one of the plagues of Egypt affected anybody who lived in the land of Goshen. And I'm saying to you today that God is clearly drawing the same line in this country and around the world. I, I remarked that uh, we, we just came back from Kenya. Uh, we hadn't been there in several years. But I remember that the first time we went there in 2011, and then just coming back this uh, last month, I could already see a difference and a change for the worse in the nation of Kenya. It's not just America. It's happening everywhere. God's people are going to have to decide, or those who call themselves God's people are going to have to decide, are you going to, are you, whose side are you going to be on? Are you, are you going to have a messed up mind, or have you got a made up mind? This is the way it's going to be. This is how I live. This is what I believe in. This is what I'm going to hold on to. I'm not changing for anybody. I'm not changing my mind for you. I don't care what, what my, I don't care what my friends do. I don't care what my church does. I don't care what my own family does. I'm not going to hell for anybody in this world. I'm going to heaven. And Jesus taught us every one of those things that I just reeled off to you. You don't follow your friends into hell. You don't follow your neighbor just to be a good neighbor. You don't follow them into hell. And you certainly don't follow family members into hell. Jesus said, if you're going to follow your family, you're not worthy to be my disciple. And that's coming from a guy, I'm big on family. I love my family. I was just like, last couple of days, I'm just going, man, I like this. This is great. I love them. But if somebody in my family doesn't want to follow the Lord, I can't help that. And I'm not going to stop believing what I believe and I'm not going to stop saying what I say and I'm not going to stop preaching what I preach just because somebody in my family don't like it. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. We've talked about this, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to deal much on this as we move along the Bible says awake to righteousness and sin not uh, let me say this while I'm looking at it awake to righteousness and sin not you can sin by your consent is that true you want me to read that to you Romans chapter 1 <clears throat> Romans chapter 1, verse 28. In verse 26 and 27, the Apostle Paul actually mentions women changing the natural use and men working that which is unseemly. So he says in verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Look at verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. 
That's one witness. I got another one for you. Turn to, um, turn to Deuteronomy, if you would. I want to hear them Bible pages turning. It sounds like this. Y'all hear that? That's what I want to hear. Bible verses. Deuteronomy 13, verse 6. <clears throat> Boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee, secretly saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. And thou shalt stone him with stones that he die, because he hath sought to thrust thee away from the Lord. Do you, do you understand that the devil will use those who are closest to you to turn your heart away from God. He'll do it every time. Now, like I said, I love my family. I love the aunts and uncles and cousins that I have left. Not many of them left. I don't have... I don't have any uh, aunts and uncles on my dad's side. He just had one sister and she died several years ago. And her husband, Uncle Harry, died a couple years ago. And then on my mom's side, it's just my mom and uh, the one sister there in Atlanta and the one brother down in uh, Little Rock. And I love them dearly. I love them to death. But they're not going to convince me to change my mind or my heart to turn away from the one who sticketh closer than a brother. Amen. I love my wife. I'd die for her. I'd kill you for her. I love her. But if she decided one day to go off and chase down, I'm not following it. I won't do it. I love my daughters. I love my sons. And over the years, I've seen the devil go after them. Oh, y'all, y'all, tell God thank you. You didn't. God didn't make you a preacher's kid. They're awful. They're mean. I love them. But I can't change for them. I love my grandkids. And right now my grandkids are at that age where they're innocent, so to speak. You know what I'm saying. But I'm not looking forward to the future. I'm not looking forward to that. Because I, I can't change just because one of my grandkids changes or just because somebody in my family decides to walk away I'm not following them you don't want to do that listen you're talking about a momentary as far as eternity is speaking you're talking about a momentary relationship with somebody on this earth that you're going to trade in an eternity in heaven for a brief period of time with somebody down here. It's not worth it. It's not. I don't know why I'm saying that. I don't know why that's in my mind. I don't know. Like I said, y'all better pray for me or I'll, it'll get worse as we go along. We better pray. Heavenly Father, I do ask for your grace this morning. 
And uh, Lord, whatever, whatever spirit, Lord, if there, is, if there is some kind of bad spirit here, I pray, Father, that through the word, I pray, Father, that through the word and our love for what you said in your, in your word and for the grace that you've manifested to us, for the love and mercy that you have given us and all the blessings that we've received in our life, Father, that, Lord, you would just give us strength to choose right, to choose you, always and that we love our family we love our friends we love all of our neighbors but father we can't change the gospel to suit them and we can't change what's right to fit their life you've called us <clears throat> you've called us out and you've called us to be different and Lord, as far as this world goes, I guess we are different now. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would just put it in our hearts. That we're going to stick with you. We're, we've made up our mind. I'm not changing. I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting. I'm not going back. There is nothing to go back to. You've burned all the bridges. You've closed the Red Sea back. Couldn't go back if we wanted to. So, Father, we're just going to go forward with you. Lord, just bless this message. Help me this morning. I pray, dear God, to preach what you would have me to preach. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would just remove any opposition to the message this morning or to the to the word of God, and Lord, that you would just fill our hearts with your goodness and fill our hearts, Father, with the right way. Show us the way to go, Lord, and we'll follow it. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. I mentioned this, uh, I believe, last week. I'm just going to kind of go through my, my notes here and move on down. That in Acts chapter 14, you'll notice that it was the unbelieving Jews that stirred up the Gentiles. And made their minds evil affected against the brethren. If you've noticed, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but if you've noticed, we now live in a country where according to the news media and, and, and according to people in our own government, now it should be a shame and a sin to be proud to be and glad to be an American. I remember right after 9-11, there was controversy now, controversy after 9-11... That Fox News was running a United States flag banner across the bottom of the screen like Go America and CNN and, and MSNBC and all those other and, and all the liberals were saying, well, that ain't right. They're just like, they're not the news. They're just pro-America. They're like forcing America. And I'm going, what's wrong with being American? What's wrong with that? They attacked us. Amen. And they just start all of a sudden now they started making it a crime almost, or a sin, or something bad to say, I'm glad I woke, I, I was born in a land, or I came to a land where we have freedom, where we have rights, where we can say what's on our mind. I got a, I got another U, a YouTube video thrown off this week. My channel is blocked. I can't upload anything for a week. I got a strike against my channel. They went back to 2021. And they said they found something that I had said about COVID that they disagree with. And so they censored my channel again this week. And I'm hotter than a firecracker over it. I'm mad. Because isn't this the land where even if we're wrong, we have a right to be wrong. Amen. And then when you take that same idea and apply it to Christianity, now in this, in this country, it's almost like it's a crime to be a born-again, Bible-believing Christian. It's a crime to say that we believe that God created us, 
6,000 years ago in six days. It's a crime to believe that, that there was a worldwide universal flood and that eight people survived it. And there was a, a piece of all the, the seed of the animals of the earth on that ark. And God used the ark to save seed on this earth. And God repopulated the earth after that. And I believe the Red Sea parted. And I believe that Jesus died. And I believe He rose again on the third day. And I believe He's up in heaven. And I believe He's coming back. Amen. And it's almost like it's a, we ought to be ashamed for believing these things. Well, I'm not ashamed. And just like taking my granddaughter out, putting a 12 gauge pump in her hand and saying, now shoot it! And people want to get, people chewed me out for that. Listen, don't chew me out for that. My granddaughter will shoot you. But notice, notice in your Bible, and you should believe. That there are unbelievers out there stirring up other unbelievers so that people's minds will be evil affected against God's people. Y'all believe that's happening? Say amen. See, that's the messed up mind. That's the mind that says that a 12 year old boy in a school can change his mind seven times that day what gender he wants to be. And that the rest of us are messed up because we think that there's only two genders. This one and that one. And this one ain't the same as that one. Amen? We're the ones messed up now for believing those things. Oh, that hurt a little bit. I'll be all right. Yeah. Do what? I can't. I can't hear what you're saying. Oh no. How old is she? What's her first name? Susie is dying of a brain aneurysm. Four brain aneurysms. She's in the hospital now, not doing well. We're going to pray for Susie right now. Is that okay? Father, Susie's still alive. And while she's still alive, Father, I, I've been... I've been with these people who admitted that the sodomite lifestyle that they lived was wrong. And I know you saved young James out of that lifestyle. And when he died of AIDS, you took him into your hand and your glory. Lord, I know that you can save the very worst of people. And so, Father, while Susie is still alive, I pray, Heavenly Father, that somebody would be able to go to her and speak the gospel before it's too late. And that she would have the ability to look at somebody still living in this world and say, thank God that Jesus saves. But Father, we lay this into your hands. We ask you to do this, Father. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, let me, let me say something about that. God's either going to wake her up, and He's going to do what we asked, or even better than what we asked. Or He may not. 
And if God chooses not to save Susie, who is a sodomite, it won't be because she is a sodomite. It will be because she is not born again. You see, I've been, I've told you this, I've been at the bedside of a young man who was a sodomite. And he specifically asked his sister to bring her preacher, which was me, to come and pray with him and lead him to the Lord. And I did. And I preached his funeral right here. And I had a militant lesbian wanting to decorate our church with AIDS ribbons. That didn't go well. But I can tell you, if God chooses not to save this young lady, let me tell you what in all likelihood will happen. Those around her will say now, she is in a better place. They will say of her, she is at peace with God. And more than likely, they'll be able to find a preacher, a pastor, or somebody who at her funeral will tell the world that she's in God's arms. She is in God's safe hands. And that she will be in heaven when all of us get there. And that's a lie. It's a lie. And I've sat through enough funerals to hear preachers do exactly that. And I'm here to tell you, it's my responsibility to tell you. Not everybody goes to heaven whose funeral you attended where they said they're in heaven now. Can I hear you say amen? Look here, I've got Romans 1.28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. God gave them over to that. What that means is God seared their conscience with a hot iron. And it means that they believe that they can live however they want to live, act however they want to act, do whatever they want to do, and God will accept them into heaven when they die without forgiveness, without repentance, without the blood of Jesus Christ, and without the cross, and without being born again. They believe that in their heart because God has turned them over to that. And I want to tell you something. I, I, I believe I'm saved. I believe I'm born again. And I believe that I still have a healthy fear of I don't want to go to hell when I die. I don't want to go to hell when I die. But the only thing worse than that is to have your conscience seared. Have God turn your mind over so that you are, you are reprobate means. See the word probate in there? We put people on probation in hopes that because they got in trouble once, that, and they may got, they had to maybe spend an hour or two in jail, or they had to spend a night in jail, or three days in jail. We're hoping now that they get out and they will live a flawless life from here on out to the end of their life. It doesn't work, by the way. It doesn't work. Not anymore. Because people are not afraid of cops anymore. They're not afraid of judges. And they're not afraid of going to jail. And it doesn't change them. And so a reprobate mind is a mind that God has fixed almost like a beast. And they're not capable of choosing Christ ever again. It's almost like God has said Ichabod on them. The glory is departed, and there is absolutely no chance whatsoever that they will even retain God in their mind, or even think that God, uh, Christ died for them, or anything like that. They automatically think that, they, that there either is no God, or that God loves them, and they'll go to heaven anyway, for no matter what they do. And I'm here to tell you, it doesn't work that way. That's a, you know what that is? That's a messed up mind. 
They are messed up. The reason why they're messed up is that either someone could have preached the gospel to them and didn't, or someone gave the gospel to them and they decided to reject it. In Ephesians chapter 2, listen to this now. This, this speaks to all of us. Lest you think I'm condemning everybody outside of this room and I'm okaying everybody inside of this room. You and I used to be the same way, did we not? Where and in time past you walked according to the course of this world. Have we not all done things that we are not proud of? Things that we do not want to stand up and confess here in this building? We would, I don't want to tell anybody some of the things I've done. We all walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit, I told you there's a spirit at work here. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom also we all, all of us, had our conversation in times past. Did you know the Apostle Paul even said some, some of the people that he ministered to used to be effeminate? That's, what is that, Galatians 5? Or somewhere. He said, some of you used to be effeminate. But you're not now. God changed you. And here it is. Boy, I'm glad I'm not in California right now. Of course, I'm glad I'm not in California at any time. But in California, I could go to jail for saying what I just said. That a homosexual can be changed by God. I could go to jail for that. I could be, we could be fined out of business here at this church. Just for saying that. That's where we are in this country. The persecution has turned on. Oh, they're not slaughtering Christians in the town square. They're just using government regulations and taxes and bank account seizures to do it. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the what? Mind. You know what I know about your mind? It's just as wicked as mine is. I know that your mind goes in places that your flesh wishes it could follow along with it. That your mind thinks, your mind imagines, your mind fantasizes. You come up with all these scenarios that you would like to be a part of and it's wicked. Think about it. The last commandment that God gave, thou shalt not covet, has no actions to it whatsoever. Coveting is 100% a sin that takes place in your mind. And who can judge that one? I can't. I can't judge your mind. I don't know what's going on in your mind. You might be thinking, I wish Hogger would hurry up. Good grief. Boy, I wish he felt worse. Maybe he'd get done quicker. I don't know. Maybe you're thinking that. I don't know. I cannot judge your mind. But God can. And God wrote down every thought that was against the knowledge of God. Didn't he? Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So if it wasn't for the grace of God... You wouldn't be sitting here in this church today. You'd probably be out with Antifa protesting somewhere. Ooh. Or, or worse, you probably would have voted for Biden. That's another strike, I think. Romans 7. Now look at what the Apostle Paul said. But I see another law in my members. Warring against the law of my mind. Bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Who is going to deliver us from the body of this death? Jesus. Amen. He's going to deliver. He's going to take us out. So then with the mind. I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, 
the law of sin. And in this case here, he's telling us we have two minds. One that's linked in with the desires of this flesh. That's where all the covetousness and the lust takes place. And the idolatry. And one then that is linked in with our soul, our spirit, and thus the spirit of God. To where I have a will and a desire in me to always do right. And that mind is made up. Y'all know what that means, right? I've made up my mind that hell is too hot, it lasts too long, and I don't want to be in it. Not for a minute do I want to be in it. So with that law, that's what uh, Paul called the perfect law of liberty. I have been set free from the law of sin and death that reigns over this flesh body. That's why this body, minus the gallbladder and six cc's of gallstones. I got to read the report. That was pretty cool. This body is not following me to heaven. Thank God. I'm going to shed this thing off. And I'm going to be free forever. Amen. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. Ephesians 4. Here's what happens to people. Paul said, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Who blind? Who is it that blinds men's eyes? The devil does. He blinds their minds. Who being past feeling. Have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. You know what that means? That this is the reason why God made them reprobate. This is the reason why God seared their conscience with a hot iron and they can do evil to somebody, look them in the eye and do it and think nothing of it and it not bother them the rest of their life. Y'all heard about that man out in Colorado that was cheating on his wife. They made the news. They made a documentary about this. Uh, Chris, uh, what was his name? Huh? Yeah. He killed his wife and, and daughters, shoved his daughters into an oil tank in a hole about this big, shoved them down in there. They, they rode, I didn't know this, they rode in the back of the pickup truck with their dead mother at their feet for an hour as their dad took them out of town, took them to the oil tank that he was going to shove them in, killed them, and then shoved their bodies down in there. And he comes, he's got the nerve now to come back. And act like he didn't do nothing. They put him on the news and he's going, I just want my family back. Oh. You know what that is? That man's understanding is darkened. That he has given himself over to lasciviousness. You see, it, it wasn't because he hated his wife. It's because he liked cheating on her with this other gal. And this world is full of people like that. Now, just for a moment, I want you to think about the ugliest, nastiest, dirtiest sin that you have ever committed. Okay, be done with it now. Don't think about it too long. Now ask yourself, do I ever want to go back to that? 
And if you haven't decided yet what that answer is, if I were you, I'd be very, very afraid. I don't know what's going to happen to you. God may just turn you over and you become reprobate. And yes, You'll be able to enjoy your sin for a season. But there is sure going to be hell to pay at the end. People give themselves over to lasciviousness. When they, tell, uh, when they try to con us and tell us that gender fluidity is part of their genetics, that they were born this way, and that... There's nothing wrong with them. In fact, they're the ones who are more right than us who, who are just content. I'm, listen, I am happy being a guy. I really am. In fact, sometimes I feel a little hormonal. But when they try to tell us that people like that should be celebrated, worshipped, that we should yield to them, give in to them, because actually they're more right than everybody else, and they have more rights than everybody else, because they're the ones who do not believe that you are born and stuck with one gender, that you stay, that you can flip back and forth to whatever you want. to. How many different genders are there now? Like something, 19, something like that? I don't understand that one. Huh? I don't even want to know. Past two, I don't want to know. Okay? But those people gave themselves over to do that. You know how I know? Because each one of us are born into sin. And those of us who are born again, we cried out to God and said, God, I don't want to be like this. And God made a change in us. Somebody say amen. Philippians 3. Let us therefore as many as, as many as be perfect. Now that's in the inner man. The inner man's perfect, not the outer man. If I was perfect, I wouldn't have needed gallbladder surgery. Right? All right. Let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if, any, and if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Which means that... I still can be wrong on things in my life as I walk through this life. But God then has the ability as I go, one day at a time, He's changed this about me, then He changed this about me, and then He's working on this now, and then God knows what He's going to work on after that. But God is the one doing the changing. It, and so if I'm, if I preach something and all of y'all going, where in the world did he get that from? Just pray for me because at some point, if I'm like way off, God will put me back on the right path. I hope. Amen. I hope God will put me back on the right path. And then y'all are saying, boy, I'm glad God changed him. Boy, Whew. now he's like us. Amen. Or the opposite. God shall reveal this even unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk of whom I told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Jerry Falwell made the mistake of putting his lost, reprobate son in charge of his ministry when he died. Liberty University. That man was lost. He was never born again. He was never saved. He hated the rules that his daddy made him live under. And now it's out it's all over the country. That him and his wife was hiring the pool boy to come in 
and perform on his wife while he sat over on the other side of the room and watched. And they were all drunks. Um, Ted Haggard, uh, past president of the National uh, Associ Association of Evangelicals, had a big megachurch out there in Colorado Springs, Colorado, leader of the, of the moral right of America, was a closet sodomite and methamphetamine addict, and is to this day reprobate. God said they are the enemies of the cross, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. Do you, you understand what that means? You know where all of our appetites are? Right there. From like here down to here. That's where all of our appetites are. Everything we lust after, that's where it is. Their God is their belly. They seek only to be gratified. And it's easy, I'll tell you what, it's easy to spot Christians like that, or people who call themselves Christians, it's easy to spot people like that. Because all they talk about is how God blessed them and how they have this and how they have that. Nonsense. Whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. It's easy to spot them. Colossians 2.18, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Puffed up. What does that mean? Proud. Bloated. Egotistical. Okay? It has a lot to do with pride. What do gay people call their parades? If you'll read um, Ezekiel 16 you'll find that that was the primary sin of Sodom. Pride and abundance of idleness and fullness of bread was the three sins of Sodom. And all of that led to what Sodom became. But the primary sins of Sodom was pride, fullness of bread, and an abundance of idol. That means they played video games all day long. Or did nothing all day long instead of went out and worked a day's work. Let me hear some men say amen. amen. Colossians 1.21 And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he... Who in, who in here would raise your hand and say, Pastor, at one time I would have hated your guts. Who would be honest enough to say that? Thank you, honest man. I mean, you love me now, don't you? I love you back. At one time, David didn't want no preachers, didn't need no preachers, didn't want anybody telling him he's going to hell, didn't want anybody telling him he was lost, that he's not living right, that he's not doing right. But when you get saved, you can't get enough of it. Am I right? I'm not going to ask you who hates me now. I won't do that. Enemies in your mind by wicked works. 1 Timothy 6. <clears throat> it's getting down to it now. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud. There it is again. He's proud, knowing nothing. But doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy. Strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness. And I, listen, I am in the church business and have been in the church business practically all of my adult life. And I know that a vast majority of pastors and preachers across this country truly, honestly believe 
that the sign that God is blessing their church hinges upon the amount of increase of the people that sit in the pews from one Sunday to the next or from one year to the next. To them, it's all about how many people we can get to come in, how our growth is, how many more do we have now than we'd had this time last year, and churches even will judge and gauge their pastor based upon how many people uh, have, how, how many, how many did you bring in last year, pastor? How many did you bring in the year before that? Well, it doesn't seem like God's blessing us because we're not growing. That didn't have anything to do with it. You don't know how many times I've come in this room and cried and bawled and squalled and prayed that God would fill every pew in this place. If the number of people who were watching right now were to come in here, we wouldn't have room for them. Now, I didn't do that. Did I, Steve? That they're not here because they know Mike. They're here because of that. That's it. Gain is not godliness. Righteousness is. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. The Bible says. From such withdraw thyself. God said get away from it. That's why we don't belong to any denomination. As far as I'm concerned. As long as I'm standing here we never will. Second Timothy. I'll quit here. Oh I guess I better. Second Timothy 3. And I'm going to be done. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. We had, they're not here yet. We ain't seen them yet. They're coming. But it's not as bad as it's going to get. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Men shall be covetous. Men shall be boasters. Men shall be proud. Men shall be blasphemers. They shall be disobedient to parents. You young people, you listen to this now. I want my grandkids to listen. If Papa or Mama hears you back talking your mama or your daddy, we will spank you. We will. Won't we? You don't be disobedient to your parents. You know what being you know what mouthing off to your mother tastes like? Blood. Doesn't it, Judy Hoggard? Tastes like blood. I mouthed my mama out here in the church parking lot one time. Next thing I know, her hand come across my mouth. And boy, it did. It tasted like blood. That's not abuse. That ain't abuse. I'm glad she did it. Uh, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers. False accusers, incontinent. You know what incontinent means? You know, we, that's a term they use in nursing. Uh, if a patient is incontinent, it means they have no control over their bodily functions. You take that and apply that now to how most people in this country act. When I was, when I was a boy, my dad could really swear. I mean, he could really curse. You know, one word I never heard my dad say was started with F. I never heard my dad say the F word, not one time. And I mean, he could get mad like anybody else and just curse and swear. And, but he never said that word. And when I was young, I used to hear men curse and it was GD and H and I, you know, I can say these words. They're all in the Bible just about, but 
I don't hear now what I used to hear 50 years ago. It's far worse. And the F word has absolutely taken over the speech of most people we know. Am I right? They have absolutely no control over their mouth. And it used to be that you didn't say these words around little kids. In fact, it used to be that you didn't say them around women either. Who's the worst at it now? I didn't say it. It is true. It is true. All you have to do is watch TikTok for 30 minutes. And then delete it, because I don't like I don't think you ought to watch TikTok. But people are incontinent now. They have absolutely no control whatsoever over their speech, over their habits, over their addictions. And you know what? They don't want control over it. That's just it. Nobody wants the laws of righteousness and morality. Nobody wants decency. Nobody wants um just kindness to one another. Nobody wants that anymore. They're incontinent. They're fierce. They're despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lust. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Janus and Jambres withstood Moses. That's two men. That's a story I won't get into, but they withstood Moses. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. It means that they are not now right and they are never going to be right. It means that, I don't have it now up on the screen. It means that they have a mind that is forever messed up. Your decision today is either to have and continue with a messed up mind or a made up mind. You've made up the decision. You're not changing. You're not flipping back. You're not turning away. I'm going to serve God. I'm not perfect. I'm never going to be until the other side of Jordan River. But I'm going to serve God. I'm going to repent of my sins. I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to stand up for what's right. And I'm going to speak out against what is wrong. No matter who does it. Whether it's me, my family, my church, my country, my neighbors. It doesn't matter. If it's wrong, it's wrong. You decide that and have your mind made up. I'm going to ask you this morning, if you would, to stand. And I'm just going to give you the opportunity this morning, while we, while we tarry, while we wait. If you'd like to come to one of these benches down here, or come down here to these steps, or come down here to this front pew and... If you, like me today, you have a little bit of a hard time getting up off your knees, then you can just sit down there. But you, you just come up here while the camera's on and you don't care who's looking at you. And you just say, you know what? I've made up my mind. I'm going to serve God. I don't care what it costs. I don't care what it takes. I don't care who likes it. I don't care who doesn't. This is the way it's going to be. This, this is like Joshua. You can be like Joshua. You can do whatever you want to, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Come on. Come on down. Come on down. I don't do this very often. I don't stand up here and beg you and try to talk you into coming down. Today I'm, I'm going to say, come on down. Come on. Come on. Let's show this world what we're made of. Let's show this world we're not backing down. Let's show, let's show YouTube that when they strike this video, 
that we don't care. We don't follow the Bible of YouTube. We don't follow the Google, the God of Google. Godgle, I guess that would be his name. We follow the Word of God. We follow the Spirit of God. We follow the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We follow the banner of the cross. And we're not ashamed of it. My prayer for you this morning is that when you're at work, you're not going to be ashamed of the cross of Jesus Christ. When you go to a restaurant, you're not going to be ashamed of bowing your head and thanking God for the things that He's blessed you with. That when you're at a family get-together, that you're not going to cower down and try to hide and downplay the fact that you go to church and you're a Christian and there are certain things that you're not going to put up with and then when they pulled the beer cans out, you're leaving. You're not going to be ashamed anymore of being what God has made you to be.